This passage of scripture, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians, the third chapter, he, uh, he says that he's praying that these people will have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So the first time I read that, or once when I was studying anyway, it, it came to me, why in the world do you need strength to understand the love of Christ? And of course, the answer is that the love of Christ is not always demonstrated in ways that are easy. We saw easy ways this week. We saw uh, many of you have been praying for John uh, Bonus as he went through his, his uh, exam. You know that the background he's had with cancer and he's gotten great news. Everything is uh, clean and we're very grateful for that. John got that news on Thursday and that's wonderful news. And then of course we've had other news. Uh, three different people that I'm aware of uh, were with us last week are not with us today. And um, the Lord has called them. And I suppose of most significance to us is uh, Dwayne Wilson's son, Chuck, who most of you, many of you know, um, fully expected to be here this week, last week at this time, and now is gone as of yesterday about noon. Um, gone from this life, certainly not gone. And so, uh, so we need to pray for the family. We need to remember them. Many of some of you were involved in a prayer vigil during the week. Some of you at the hospital most of the week, day and night. Uh, what what friends they had surrounding them, and what a great uh, witness to the to the Lord. And even though the prayers weren't answered exactly the way we would have liked, I think the strength to understand that the love of Christ is demonstrated there in some way that we don't understand completely yet. But it is. So let's pray for strength for ourselves, for Jeanette, Sydney, Molly, the family, Karen and Tom. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for these reminders that your love is sometimes easy and sometimes hard. And uh, we, we need the strength to, to, uh, to understand the full depth and, and, and length and breadth of the height of your love. To understand that we're embraced by your arms regardless of the circumstances. To understand that there's always, Lord, you, we have the small picture, you have the big picture. And so there are things that we can't grasp yet that come from these uh, sudden and unexpected events. And so we commit them to you. We pray for your uh, will to be worked out through them. We pray that the purposes you desire to accomplish would be accomplished Lord, we just pray with all of our heart there will be no wasted loss, time, grieving. Lord, just that it will all be for a purpose. Pray for our brothers and sisters all over the world, Father, who are being persecuted and losing their lives on a daily basis because just of their stand for you. We have such a skewed view of life in many ways. Help us to appreciate what we do have, to take advantage of what it is that we do have, Thank you for those who have protected them. Lord, I think of the honor flight that uh, will be going uh, soon. And I pray for Stan and Cicely as they are the ones who are helping prepare for that. And many of our congregation who have been involved in this, either monetarily or actually going over the years, we pray that you will use this as a time to bring glory to yourself through the remembrance of the men and women who have given so much so that we have the freedoms that we have. Lord, help our attention and time always ultimately to be pointed toward you. Help us to understand that we need you more than anything. And we pray now for those who have been bereaved this week, those who have suffered loss. Lord, it's one thing when it's expected. It's another thing when it's totally unexpected. And uh, we pray that somehow you will fill ultimately a void that cannot be filled except by you. We pray that you will bring comfort. We pray that you will bring a sense of your presence that is greater than it's ever been before. That you will be so real that we will all understand the urgency of the things we do here week by week. Father, we come and because it's been the same for 60 years, we just assume it'll always be the same. And yet every week we come with no guarantee. And so the message is urgent from week to week that we get it that we understand what it is your word is trying to say to us, to prepare us for an eternal existence. 
how I pray that you will impress upon our minds and hearts the things that we need to know and to learn and to obey. We pray this for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in his name we pray. Amen. Well, turn with me, if you will, to uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. So we continue uh, today and uh, next week, Lord willing, to with the uh, this parable of the prodigal sons, come to this section on the elder brother today. And so I'm going to pick up reading in First Corinthians or in uh, Luke 15, beginning at verse 25, as we see what happens with the elder brother. Now his older brother was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. So his father came out and entreated him and he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and to be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. A guy named Harvey turned uh, 110 years old. So as always happens when somebody hits a milestone like that, a reporter showed up at his doorstep and said, uh, Harvey, what do you attribute this longevity to? Or he said, well, I'm a, I'm a health nut. He said, I, I watch what I eat, I watch what I drink, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't smoke and drink, I don't run around, I, don't, I never caroused. He said, I, I, I took good care of myself, I exercised every day, I said, I, uh, I was sensitive to uh, how I was living. And the reporter said, you know, it's interesting, my, I, I have an uncle who does the same exact thing and he died at age 58. How come it didn't work for him? And said, well, I, I guess he just didn't keep it up long enough. Um, I guess we could say the same is true with regard to working your way to God, right? You can try forever. It won't work. There is no long enough to get it right when it comes to working our way to God. It's not about, you know, I could just get this across to me and to all of us. It's not about good works. It's about good news. And the good news in this chapter is that God comes to seek and to save those who are lost. The theme verse of Luke is illustrated so beautifully in this 15th chapter. You know, there are four things that are lost in the 15th chapter of Luke. Three of them are obvious. One of them is not so obvious. In the first two parables there, we have a lost sheep and we have a lost coin. And you remember how much effort is expended to find these two things that are lost. And then we get to this parable of the prodigal sons, and there is a young man who takes his inheritance early and squanders it. He's clearly lost. Goes away to a far country. But the interesting thing is, Jesus spends just as much time on the elder brother here as he does on the younger brother. Why does he do that? Well, he does that because the elder brother is just as lost as the younger one. He's just as lost as the younger one. In fact, he's more lost because he doesn't realize he's lost. The elder brother is the one who's done it all right. He's always been right there on time. He's always done what was asked. He's gone through all the motions and all the hoops, and so he's kind of lived this, we'd look at it and call it a perfect life. You know, when he says in verse 29, look, these many years I have served you and I've never disobeyed your command, he's not kidding. He really means that. And yet he's just as lost as his brother. He has no more relationship with the father than does the younger brother. The younger brother 
is lost by breaking the law. The older brother is lost by keeping the law. The younger brother eventually comes to his senses and is saved, but the fate of the elder brother isn't really told in this passage. Jesus leaves it open. We'll see if there's any indication later on, but the elder brother, the, the younger brother represents the tax collectors and the sinners, the people that were coming to Jesus, you know, that society considered outcasts. And many of them were coming, and they were hearing the message, and they were believing in Jesus. The elder brother represents the scribes and the Pharisees, those who had no use for the, for the ultimate message of Jesus. They, they liked the healing, they liked the entertainment, but they had no use for the teaching that Jesus was the only way to the Father. They thought their supreme efforts to keep the, the law was the way that they would get to God. They failed to acknowledge that their good would never be good enough. So, as Jesus has done many times in the Gospels, he gives this parable not to condemn them, but to one more time invite them in. He's trying to show them the error of their way. He's trying to get them to reconsider. He's trying to get them to turn around, to come to him. The parable doesn't tell us the end because it's left open. What do the scribes and Pharisees do? The, the point is the, the decision is now up to them. Jesus leaves it open. But at the same time he leaves it open for them, he leaves it open for us as well. This makes this parable critical, critical to all of us because you see many of us, it's possible that we are the elder brother. Where do you find elder brothers? And the answer is, in church. They're the ones who are doing everything right. They're the ones who are following everything they can think of that they know of as the law of God. They're not the ones that are outwardly clenching their fist in the face of God, defiantly going their own way like the younger brother did. They're the churchgoers. They're the law keepers. They're the ones who are trying to do everything right. That's why we are so apt, potentially, to be the elder brothers, to be condemned by keeping the law rather than breaking it. So as we look at this account of the elder brothers, I think we need, you know, the question we need to be asking is, could this be me? Am I really trusting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross to take away my sins. Is that what I'm really trusting in? Am I trusting in somehow my, my own good works to get me through? Good works are wonderful, beloved, but they're wonderful as a response to the gospel, not as a way to get the gospel, as a way to somehow create it. And here's the interesting thing. The the, the elder brother in this parable is clearly not a saved individual, not representing an individual who has a relationship with the father. So the main interpretation of this parable would be this is a person who thinks they are saved but who are not. And we'll see that as we go through it. But I want us to, because, and, and that could very well be, and probably is some of us who are here today, but there are others of us who are truly saved. We really do belong to Christ. We really have put our faith and trust in him. But the characteristics of the elder brother somehow kind of tend to hang on. And they do in many cases. We're none of us perfect. So as we look through this, I want you not to just think, oh, well, that's just the unsaved people. I don't have to worry about this. This may be true of us as well. As we look at these various characteristics. Now, we're going to see seven, six of them over the next couple of weeks that identify what another elder brother thinks like. What is he like? Six characteristics. If you'll notice, this parable is built around, you know, it's about shame. It's about shame. In the day and time in which Jesus was ministering, you know, the worst thing somebody could do is almost like a capital offense to bring shame on the family. We have a little bit of that left, but I'm not sure too many people worry too much about that. I'm not sure our generation did, let alone the generation that we're going through now. 
But in those days, it was at the top of everyone's list. So when the second son, the younger son, asked for his inheritance and took off and squandered it and went to a far country, he shamed his family. It was very clear for all to see and his actions were considered, would have been considered reprehensible. But he repented. He returned home. He came back. The older brother is the one who eventually is the one who brings ultimate shame on his family because even though he never leaves home, even though he never does any of the outward things that would show him to be such a rebel inside. He's a rebel. And that's what we'll see as we go through these characteristics. So let's look at them. Six characteristics of the elder brother. First of all, he is shame, shamefully rebellious. The elder brother is shamefully rebellious. Now, this is not immediately obvious, right? The younger brother, man, he didn't make any bones about it. It was a lot the same in our own family as we were growing up. I was the oldest. I had a second brother. Eventually, we had a whole bunch of other little guys. But John and I would have represented this. I was outwardly, man, I was good as gold. John, his rebellion was very outward. Mine was inward. We would have been very good representatives of this parable. The elder brother here is much more subtle. To, to look at him, you wouldn't know that there was rebellion going on in the inside. It's inward rather than outward. See here, but here's the problem. It's the inside that counts, right? It's the inside that counts. That's why I say 1 Samuel 16, 7 is one of the key verses in the whole Bible, just you know, kind of hidden back there in Samuel, where God says through the prophet Samuel, he says, man looks on outward appearance, but God looks on what? The heart. God isn't fooled by outward appearances. God sees right through to the bottom where the problem is. The elder brother's problem was all internal. So here comes the brother, the younger brother. He's back. The party is given. And the, and, the, and the elder brother now has just found out that his idiot brother is back, right? And not only is he back, but they're giving a huge party for him. Who would have figured this? So what's his reaction? Go. Well, verse 28, but he was angry. He refused to go in. So his father came out and he treated him. He answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, never disobeyed, but you never gave me a goat. You never let me celebrate with my friends. He's not about to go in. Father's just as gracious, notice, with the older brother as he is with the younger. He begs him to come and join the festivities, but he is met with stone-cold resistance by the elder brother. Why is that? Because what's inside is coming out. What's always been there the whole time is now spewing forth like a volcano that suddenly blows, right? What's been there all the time lying dormant is now revealed. And this older brother is revealed for the rebellious ingrate that he really is. It's like, uh, what's that old show, the, the green guy? What was that guy? The Incredible Hulk, remember him? And when he, what was it? When he got mad or something, bam, he turned into this monster. Well, the monster is now out with the elder brother. He's revealed for what he really is. Because it's, what in, it's what's inside that counts. God knew it all the time. But now everybody's going to find out. Now, the elder brother went through all the right motions, considered a paragon of virtue for all, uh, to all around him. But notice two phrases here that really point out his inward rebellion. There are two phrases that bring this home. His self-righteousness. It's like a red flag here. Verse 29, he says, Look, these many years I have served you. You know, most of the time when you see that word serve in the New Testament, you can just translate the word Slave. In the English versions of the Bible, starting with the King James and working on up, they've tended to use the word serve or servant instead of, or sometimes bond servant, because slavery had such a bad connotation. And part of that time, people were even trying to defend slavery on the basis of the Bible, so it was more convenient to translate servant, the word doulos. But the word doulos in Greek means slave. It's talking about slavery. And what this guy is saying, man, I slave for you. He's just not saying I serve you. I, I, I slave for you. That's how I looked at myself. I slave for you. He had no relationship with the father. 
he considered dad a master, a monstrous master who demanded of him. He saw his relationship only as one of a slave. You can see that he considers himself that way. When the father plans the party, the elder brother has no part in that. He has no relationship with the father. He's not serving. He's not doing because he loves the father, because he appreciates what he has, because he wants to show his appreciation. He's serving only for what he can get. He's, listen, this kid owes only one thing in mind, this young man, what he can get out of this. He has no care for anybody else, certainly no care for his father, no care for his brother. He thought that he had to work to earn the father's favor. It never occurred to him that he already had the father's favor. This was a master-slave relationship as far as he was concerned. In that attitude, he represents the many who will stand before Jesus one day. And they will say to Jesus, look, these many years I have slaved for you. These many years I have slaved for you. I have killed myself. I bent over backwards to earn your favor. I bent over backwards to represent you. I bent over backwards to do the things that were right. And now you're telling me it's got not good enough. You know what Jesus is going to say? Jesus is going to say, no, I'm not telling you that now. I told you that long ago. You just weren't listening. Where were you when the church was memorizing Romans 3.23? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Come short of the glory of God. You weren't listening? Surely you remember Romans 10, 11, where I told you no one seeks after God. I told you your good isn't good enough. Don't you remember Isaiah 64, 6, where I told you your goodness, your best day. is like a polluted rag in terms of earning my favor. Jesus will say to those on that, on that day the same thing that he said he was going to say in, in Matthew 7, where he said, look, many will say to me in that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we cast out demons in your name? Did we do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, I'm going to say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Jesus is going to say, I told you this was coming. I warned you, your good isn't good enough. Your good could show appreciation for what I've done for you, but your good can never earn your way in. And you were trying to earn your way in. You were misusing it. It was never about the good works you could do for me to get right with God. It was always about the good news of what I did for you so you could be right with God. And you ran roughshod over that good news. You refused to accept it. You insisted that you could earn your own way. And now we're proving you can't. So the first phrase that characterizes inward rebellion, look, these many years I have slaved for you. Is that your relationship with Jesus? Young people, is that your relationship with Jesus? Look, I'm slaving for you, God. My mom and dad say I have to do that, so okay, I'm following through. Is that how you look at Jesus? Because if you are, it's an elder brother mentality. It's showing that you probably don't have a relationship at all. People who are doing good works because they love Jesus, that's a whole different thing than doing him to try and earn his favor. He's already earned the favor for you. So our goodness is to be a reflection of our appreciation and our love for him, for what he's done for us. How I've slaved for you. Second thing that shows his rebellion is also in verse 29. Look at this. I never disobeyed your command. I never disobeyed your command. Really? Never? Well, okay, once in a while, maybe I, you know, got off the path there for a minute, but... You can't, you know, I, look, you know that I'm the best guy around here. You know that nobody else has a son like me. You know 
that I have curried your favor. I've done everything you ever asked. I am not, you cannot, even though I might have done one or two things wrong, you cannot say I'm a disobedient person. And Jesus will say, really, have you looked inside? Have you looked into your heart? Because see, hearts count. It's what's inside that counts. And while you may have been doing the right things outside, you were screaming against them inside. You hated every minute of this. You did not obey me because you wanted to. Inside, inside you're a toxic waste dump. There's resentment, there's bitterness, there's anger. In your heart of hearts, you are livid with God because he has required this of you, the self-righteous. They're rebels with a cause, and their cause is to be their own savior. Their cause is to be their own savior. Elder brothers are trying to save themselves, and it simply will not do. Jesus addresses this later with the Pharisees. You know, there's a whole, really, there's almost a whole chapter on it. It's a, it's a tough chapter to read. Matthew 23. But here's what he says in verse 25 and 26 there. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside, inside, you are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside also may be clean. The outside is supposed to be clean. But the outside can only be the outside can only be pleasing to God if the inside is right. And the inside was all wrong. Jesus' point in this parable is that the elders, the elder brothers' true colors are now coming out. All the time inside he had been rebellious, shamefully rebellious against the Father. It's just all that's all that's happening now is it's being revealed what he really was all along. And so we have to ask ourselves, as he should have been asking himself, who am I? Who am I inside? Who am I in my heart of hearts? That's where the real me is living. So he's shameless, shamefully rebellious. Secondly, he is shamefully obedient. He is shamefully obedient. Sounds like an oxymoron, right? Like large shrimp or whatever those are. <laughs> Shamefully obedient. How can those two words go together? How can you be shameful and also be obedient at the same time? The answer is in verse 29. Look, these many years I have slaved for you. What is obe when is obedience shameful? When it's done out of a sense of slavery. When it's done, done out of a sense of obligation. When it's done out of a sense of duty. Listen, I'm not saying that we never do something that we don't really want to do because deep down we want to obey Christ. That, yes, that's true. But when our whole existence basically revolves around just doing something good because that's going to somehow ingratiate ourselves to God, then we are shamefully obedient. And he knows because he sees the heart. He knows what's going on. This brother, this elder brother was doing what the father asked. He was being obedient, but he was hating every minute of it. It just frosted him that he had to go through these motions. Undoubtedly, he was cutting corners wherever he could because people who are shamefully obedient do that because it's all about the outward, right? And as long as I can look good, what difference does it make how I get there? Shamefully obedient, but no relationship, no love, no caring, no thought of anyone beyond himself. This man's... Obedience, again, is representing in this parable the attempts of the scribes and Pharisees to earn heaven by being good. It's, and man, that is a dreary thing. It, you know, it's tiring. It's fatiguing. It's frustrating. It's obedience, which is shameful. Shameful obedience leads to nothing. It's a great story about Alexander Pope, the uh, English writer, died in 1744, and as he was on his deathbed, doctor came in one day, and you know, there was nothing more he could do, but he, he wanted to kind of be encouraging, so he said to Pope, he said, well, he said, uh, you know what, I, th I think your color looks a little better today. 
said, uh, your, your heart seems a little stronger, your pulse is, is better, and you know, showing he hadn't lost his sense of humor, and standing by, and Pope said to him, he said, well, here I lay, dying of good symptoms. <laughs> That's, you see, the elder brother. He's dying of good symptoms. His goodness itself is taking him to the grave because he's counting on the wrong thing. He's dying of a hundred good symptoms, trying to do his best, trying to get right with God, trying to ingratiate himself instead of realizing I'm already right with God. Jesus has already paid that price. So what I offer him now in terms of the way I live is out of a heart of love and and, and gratitude and consideration for him and desire to see his blessed name lifted up, not mine, to see his agenda accomplished instead of mine. Do you see the difference? It's, 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 it's what's inside that counts. Thirdly, he is shamefully angry. Shamefully angry, verse 28, but he was angry. Should he have been angry? No, but he was. It's a shameful anger. He was angry and he refused to go in, so his father came out and, retreated and, and entreated him. He wouldn't go in. He refuses his father's gracious invitation. Why? Because legalism hates grace. Because trying to do right for the wrong reasons can't stand to see somebody else receiving grace. Can't stand it. Hates it. Legalism can't be in the same room with grace. This young man couldn't, it killed him to see this younger brother, even though he was repentant, being treated this way. It felt like he had earned this and he hadn't been given it and here's his younger brother and he's getting everything, pure grace. It is pure grace, isn't it? it was, as we've seen, there was nothing that the younger brother had to commend himself. There was nothing he had to offer to get the things he was getting. It was all by the grace of the father that he was getting them. That was the illustration. But the younger, the elder brother who was doing everything right outwardly but was a toxic dump inwardly was angry, shamefully angry at grace. Hated grace. I'll tell you what's wrong with that, beloved. It depreciates the cross eventually, right? Because if Jesus actually paid for what the father gives us, it's, it's not like we get something free and it hasn't been paid for. It's been paid for at the cross. So to be angry that somebody else receives grace from God is to be depreciating what Jesus did on the cross. It's a shameful anger. It's a shameful anger. Legalism, you see, doesn't realize it needs grace just as bad as the other guy. That was the problem, ultimately, with the elder brother. He didn't see that it wasn't just the younger brother who was in outward rebellion that needed grace of the Father. It was him who had inward rebellion that also needed the grace of the Father. So he was shamefully angry. Anger is a pretty good key to the possibility that we have an elder brother mentality. Because anger tends to characterize elder brother. We're always looking down on someone when we're an elder brother. And partly, you, know, you can understand this because, because we, we think we've earned something that we ought to get and we're not getting it, so we're angry at somebody else who gets it and it doesn't look like they earned it. But it's a shameful anger. Look, we'll look at this more next week, but elder brothers, elder brothers they kind of live by this principle. They, 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 they believe that this is the principle that should characterize existence. And the principle is this. If I live a good life outwardly, I should get a good life. I should get a good life. If I do this right, then God ought to do this for me. The assumption is I can put God under obligation to me by the way I act. Can you see the foolishness of that kind of perspective? We don't put God under obligation ever. The elder brother thinks they can. And so when things go wrong, when life goes belly up, you know, when somebody comes along and the doctor says, well, it's cancer, or he says, there's nothing more we can do, 
Or, you know, someone comes along and says, sorry, but Aunt Mary gave all, of, all that she had to the dog. You know, I, I don't know what the bad news is, but whatever the bad news is when it comes into our life, we become angry, we become bitter, and we become, and we stay that way. That's a problem. Because that's an indication that we have, that we are either in the lost state of the anger, elder brother of this parable, or at least that we're living as though we are an elder brother, even though we, even though we may be a Christian. Elder brothers are critical. They're not happy people. And at the, you know at the root of all of this? They hate the father. They hate the father. They see the father as being unfair. I hear people say this once in a while. Well, you know, I'm really angry at God. And they kind of use, you know, they, they pick out some psalm somewhere and say it's okay to be angry at God. Well, it is okay to be angry at God for a really short period of time. If you'll read those Psalms where David was angry at God and he expressed himself because God can take it. God can, and it's true. God can hear our, you know, the cares of our heart. And he wants to hear the cares of our heart, but you can't, you can't live there, beloved. You have to move on. And if you read those Psalms of David, you'll find out before the end of the Psalm, he moves on. And so must we. A lifestyle of anger at God is wrong for the simple reason that God is always right and we're always wrong. Elder brothers think they can put God under obligation. Thomas Fuller was an old Puritan preacher. He said this. He said, be soonest angry with yourself. He was making a point. If you're going to be angry, it better be at yourself. See, self, see, see self, self-centered anger points its finger outward, blames other people. God-centered anger points itself at ourselves. It's realizing we're the root of our own problems. Self-centered anger is proud. It sees itself as being better than others. God-centered anger is humble. It sees ourselves as being what we are, weak people who need the, who are dependent on God for every minute of our lives. Self-centered anger points, eventually points the finger at God and says, who are you to do this to me? God-centered anger points the finger at self and says, who are you to be blaming God? Listen, listen carefully, beloved. We can live in the place where what we're doing is itemizing the imperfections of God. That's what the elder brother does. And here's the problem with that. There are no imperfections in God. God does all things well. God never does anything wrong. God loves you in whatever he's doing. And God does it for his glory. Charles de Gaulle, this, this is a perfect illustration. Now you, you have to listen carefully to kind of grab this, but Charles de Gaulle said this once. He said, when I am right, I get angry. And then he said, when Churchill gets angry, I, I, let me back up. He says, when I am right, I get angry. He said, Churchill gets angry when he is wrong. So we are very often angry at each other. And if you think about that, what he's saying is, I'm always right and Churchill's always wrong, so we're always angry. And that's what the elder brother is saying about God. I'm always right, God's always wrong, and so I have a right to be angry. It's not true. Anger, bitterness, hostility, you know, just, 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 just a little irritation of our life because this is what God has given us should be a, a red flag that's going up saying, you know what, I've, I've got an elder brother mentality here. Is it because I truly don't even know the Father? Or am I just living in the old self? Anger, shameless anger. Fourthly, the elder brother is shameless, shameful, shameful, shamefully joyless. He's shamefully joyless. There's no joy in his life. Think about it. I mean, yeah, and, and I'm not recommending this, but think about it. The younger brother at least had fun for a while, right? He was out having a good time. The elder brother, he's at home the whole time just angry at what he's having to do. There's no joy in his life. There could be. There should have been. Should have been able to take joy in the father, joy in the family, joy in the relationship, joy in what he had. Instead, he's trying to earn it all. 
He's shamefully joyless. Here's why elder brothers are shamefully joyless, because they are dependent for their salvation on their being good. And when they see anybody else who's better than them, that's a problem, because that may mean they're too low on the totem pole. Never know when you're good enough, when you're trying to be good, to earn your way to God. And so you're pretty joyless, because you gotta be critical. You have to be, you have to be analyzing others. You have to be seeing all the things that they're doing. You have to be down on them. And that is a joyless existence. But that's the elder brother. Think of it another way. The elder brother is always doing outwardly what he hates inwardly. That's a tough spot to be in. It's joyless. So perhaps you don't find much joy in your life this morning. So the question would be, well, is, are you an elder brother? Is it possible? Elder brother, elder sister. Is it possible that the, that the things we're picking up here out of this parable are characteristic of your life and you don't really know the Father? Because when you know the Father and when you're a brother of the Son, I mean, it's kind of hard to keep joy from welling up. It's a part of who you are. But the elder brother is joyless. You can't be joyful when you don't know if your good, if you're good, if you're good is good enough. And nobody ever knows that. Think it is, hope it is, trust it is. Probably it is, but I don't know for sure. And yet they hang on to their goodness as the way to get to the Father. To hear the Father say you're not good enough really, I mean, just, it just frosts the elder brother. So when elder brothers hear the preacher say things like, you know, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, their hackles go up. It's not me. It's not, I, that's, I, okay, I, so the Bible says that. I don't, I don't buy that. Don't preach that to me. Their hackles go up when they hear Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. All, we've all turned our own way. Gone our own way. Don't like to hear that. Why? Because it puts us all in the same boat. Puts us in the same boat with, the, with that rascally younger brother. They don't like to hear it because their inside is being exposed by the words of the word of God. And so they're joyless. But here's what they're missing. Here's what elder brothers are missing. God doesn't say those things to condemn us, although in the end those words will condemn us. But he's told us those things now. He's told us those things in this life. He's told us those things in his word to turn us toward him. He's told us those things in the hope that we will turn from the selfishness that characterizes our life. From the self-centeredness. From the only my desires get fulfilled here. He wants to turn us from that to a life that accepts God. You know, this is the broad way or the narrow way and he wants to turn us from that broad way that eventually leads to destruction to the way that leads to life. Elder brothers are, are joyless. They're like the guy, you know, they're like the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist had a patient who had come to him and he just said, I'm a, I'm a loser. He said, what do you mean you're a loser? He said, nothing I ever do turns out right. He said, everything I, everything I touch turns bad. Everything I do, every, you know, if I, if I, were, if I were playing a basketball game or whatever, he said the, the rebounds would all go to somebody, all the loose balls would go to the other team. He said, I'm a loser. That's just who I am. Well, he came running in one day, one day and he said, hey, Doc, guess what? I'm not, I'm not a loser anymore. The doc said, what do you mean you're not a loser? How do you know you're not a loser? He said, well, I, he said, I, dropped, I dropped my muffin this morning on the floor and it, and it landed butter side up. I, 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 that has never happened to me. You don't understand. I am not a loser anymore. And the doc looked at him and said, well, not so fast. He said, listen, you probably buttered it on the wrong side. <laughs> That's elder brother mentality. They have no joy in their life and they don't want anybody else to have any joy either. Condemning others. Judgmental attitude. No joy. So elder brothers look good on the outside. Poison on the inside. because they don't have Christ. They don't have Christ. It's a great story about James Thurber, the writer, remember him, and, and he, he was blind toward the end of his life. 
was at a party one night and he was standing by the host as, every, as everybody was leaving and one couple went out. They said goodnight to the host and uh, as soon as they were gone, Thurber turned to the host and he said, uh, that, th- those, they're not going to be together very long. And the host said, what do you mean? He said, those, they, they exhibit some of the most loving characteristics I've ever seen. You, you don't see how they hang on each other and so on. And he said, no, I didn't see them, but I heard them. And see, what he heard was the toxicity that was inside welling up. And even though it hadn't hit the surface yet, he could hear it. That's the elder brothers. The elder brothers are poison on the inside, and sooner or later, beloved, it will come out. So Jesus is asking us by means of this parable, check yourself, who are you? Are you an elder brother? What's inside? It's what's inside that counts, and it's not about good works. It's about the good news of a Savior who has come to change us from the inside out if we will seriously ask him to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder. We pray that we will see ourselves for who we really are inside, for who you see us to be. We pray that we will be half as appalled as you are, enough to throw ourselves in your mercy and say, Lord, I see it. Change me. Please change me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And you'll do that. But we must ask. If there are those of us who are truly saved here today, but some of these characteristics, we can kind of look and say, yeah, you know what? I I see myself there. I see some of that shameful anger. I see some of that shameful joylessness. I see some of those characteristics. Well, we too can come to you, Father, and the gospel is just as good for us as believers as it is for when we came to Christ. It's covered. But we need to confess and acknowledge it and let you cleanse us. So whatever our need today, as we sing this closing hymn, Change My Heart, Father, may it be true, may it be true, call those to yourself this morning that you desire, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.